Hearing. Councillor McNally. Thank you, sir. Um, just to start, I do have notes here which you may wish to see afterwards. Um, uh, I can certainly provide them to you. Uh, we're looking at, um, at BA1, and this site looks to provide 2,800 homes. It's far and away the largest single site in the plan, and it's bolted onto the oldest and most historic town in North Hearts. As it stands, it will devastate the character and environment of Baldock. My first premise is that it is far too large to be sustainable. Having said that, uh, I have gone into this argument at great length in my written submission, so I don't propose to, uh, to do that here. Uh, but it is, in, it is worthwhile putting it into Baldock and Baldock's situation into context. The 2011 census gives Baldock 4,491 homes. Uh, this plan looks at Baldock assimilating a further 3,590. That's an 80% increase of homes in the town, almost doubling the town in one fell swoop over the period of the plan. And uh, so as far as uh, uh, that will, that will um, raise insurmountable traffic problems, which have already been um, raised here, uh, the link road, it is said, will direct traffic away from, um, from Baldock. Uh, Having said that, um, my view is that the link road, which at the moment is, is planned to go through the centre of BA1, uh, it should be a perimeter-based link road, and, uh, uh, which would mitigate the impact of a major road running through a large development. But that link road will actually direct uh, people living on the eastern edge of BA1 into the Baldock traffic light junction, unless they wish to go uh, um, uh, up the A505, they'll, they will be fed into that junction, significantly increasing the junction through. I do note the um, the, the, the the traffic experts. Um, proposal and the council's proposal to initiate smart traffic lights to, um, to facilitate uh, the increase in traffic at that junction. But what do you do when your smart traffic lights say there's too much traffic, which my contention is will be the case? Um, <clears throat> if you do consider the site should remain largely unchanged as far as its size is concerned I would invite you to consider the following the southern edge of site BA1 currently abuts the northern part of the town surrounding the Salisbury and Bygrave Road area and extending as far as the southernmost tip of Bygrave why not move the whole site northwards as far as Newnham Road while retaining a similar area this would create a ribbon of green belt between the garden village of North Baldock and increase the gap between the new development and Bygrave, enabling the green belt to do what it was originally intended to do, prevent the coalescence of communities. I shall stop there, sir. Yeah, my, my um, apologies. Can, can you just explain that to me so that, um, so that I have it in my mind's eye? Certainly, sir. The BA1, the site itself would could be moved northwards. In fact, it would be slightly northwestward. If you look slightly northwest, just below south of the service area, and it's the tip of the Green Belt area, so it would still remain in Green Belt, uh, there's a road running from <coughs> excuse me, North Road to um, Noonan. It's Noonan Road. And if it were moved up 
to that area, then the effect would be that um, there will be a, a significant ribbon of green belt protecting north of Baldock. The council has accepted the principle of garden village, garden town, garden city development and has stated that it will incorporate that into its next plan. There's an opportunity to do this now. So you, you mean in a sense like a, a mini new town if I can put it that way? Uh, yes, it's, uh, it, it's a settlement which would sit on its own. It could be part of Baldock Town. It could set separately. But I understand. Thank you. Um, I've spoken to the owners of the land who tell me that uh, they spoke to the council um, some time ago and they stated that they were not, would not speculatively put forward land for development, but were prepared to work with the council to enable development of their land in accordance with SP9, retaining the respect uh, and, uh, where possible, enhance the existing character of both the urban and rural areas and maintaining the quality of the district's environment. My first premise, I will uh, emphasise, though, is that um, the number and the amount of development is too large, and I would refer you to my written submission. <coughs> the other um, thing that I would add, um, just by way of uh, evidence of the, um, the, the traffic impact on the Baldock ATS junction, um, this morning, um, there was a, 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 a tailback of almost a mile along North Road of traffic trying to get into Baldock Town at that junction. That was uh, at about 7.30 this morning. That is not unusual, and I have seen similar tailbacks at 11.30 in the morning. I have photographic evidence, but I haven't got it here. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McKnight. Uh, Mr Jarvis. Thank you, sir. Um, I regret I don't have any notes in a form that you'd be able to understand. Um, but there were two, two areas that I wish to address. The, the first relates to the Green Belt and the second relates to the uh, transport and travel aspects of, of BA1. In, in terms of the green belt, we've, uh, the council has admitted that the, that the land makes uh, a moderate contribution to the green belt, uh, and it is interesting that in order to uh, obtain a satisfactory boundary to the green belt, uh, the suggestion is that development should not proceed to the boundary of the, the site, as was discussed earlier, um, but should be held back in order to enable a, a, a green belt boundary to be created, in a sense. Uh, and uh, not only does that apply uh, to the, the boundary between the site and the countryside to the north, but it also applies uh, to the relationship between the site and Bygrave. The site is set out in the plan, envisages a boundary that runs right up to the, the first house in Bygrave, uh, and then relies upon some restraint area uh, to ensure that there isn't, uh, isn't coalescence with the village. Um, as we have heard earlier, that uh, that could be subject to, to change as part of the, the planning process uh, and seems to me does not support the objective of the Green Belt to avoid coalescence between settlements. Um, so the, the, uh, the boundary of the, of the proposed development is significantly inside the boundary of the proposed Green Belt and it's my contention that if that land should not be developed... Um, beyond uh, the ridge line and, and in close proximity to Bygrave, then that land should not be excluded from the Greenbelt. 
The second area I wanted to address was the, the question of uh, traffic and transportation. Uh, and the, we've had a discussion earlier about the, uh, what of the traffic modelling is, is uh, part of the local plan. One of the issues that concerns me is that my understanding is that the traffic models that have been used in production of the information supporting the local plan uh, uses a model uh, which places Bulldog at the very edge of the modelled area. Um, and, of course, uh, that means that the model potentially fails to take into account um, traffic arising from outside that area and, and particularly traffic from arising outside Hertfordshire. And, of course, much of the queue... Uh, that Councillor McNally spoke about uh, recently is traffic that has emanated not from Baldock but from, uh, from other settlements. It's clear from, uh, from the current uh, traffic position in Baldock uh, that this development requires, um, requires the construction of the link road, um, but that, that road has a major road to play, has a major role to play in terms of removing traffic from the centre of Baldock um, in order that those who would, who would live in this development are able to access the town and avoid a situation where it develops as a, as a separate community uh, whose sustainability and, and whose, um, um, whose viability would be much less. Um, it's uh, therefore my contention that the that the link road should perform that role of, as a strategic route and should be located around the edge of the proposed development rather than through the middle of it uh, to avoid uh, an undesirable impact on the, on the uh, quality of the environment in the development. Uh, now, there, are, there have been suggestions that, that through traffic could be deterred from using this link road. Uh, firstly, I think it's questionable whether or not that can be achieved in the face of lengthy delays on the existing routes. Uh, and secondly, I think it's, it's clear that it's not desirable to achieve it because, as we have heard, traffic levels in Baldock particularly, but not only at the, at the traffic lights, are already uh, at capacity for much of the day. I think that the other question in terms of, of uh, transportation that I wish to address is the importance of ensuring that uh, to allow this community to connect with the rest of the town, uh, it is vital that suitable crossings across the railway uh, for pedestrians and cyclists be provided. Um, the plan indicates that one into the proposed industrial area, um, but is much less clear about how connections will be provided into the town. Uh, and if we are to avoid uh, substantially greater traffic impacts, it's important that people, anyone who lives in this development is able to access the town and its facilities uh, without either having to take a, a long detour um, round by the new, uh, new road bridge um, or uh, through the already congested North Road. Uh, and uh, the final point I wish to make is that we're, we're told that this site is deliverable in the very short term, um, it's clear that it's not deliverable without the link road in some form uh, and that relies on the crossing of the railway uh, and it seems to me to be difficult to envisage that the crossing of the railway uh, can be achieved uh, in time to secure development and delivery of, of uh, the first units within the next two to three years. Thank you. Thank you.
Waterfield. You won't be surprised to hear I'm going to make very similar comments to the ones you've already heard in, in the last hour or so, um, so please bear with me, but they are very important fundamental points, so, so forgive me, I'm going to repeat. <laughs> um, Safe Rural Bulldog does not believe that the um, allocation of houses to BA1 is deliverable. Um, whilst acknowledging that Hertfordshire County Council have put their land forward to be available, um, we do not believe that safe and appropriate access has been demonstrated or that the scale of the proposed building within Bulldog is deliverable. The main objection is clearly the traffic. The junction um, is uh, much more of a problem than was indicated earlier by the council's numbers. Um, I think a, a two minute delay was mentioned. Um, I think you need a zero on the end of that. Um, if you come out in the morning from the junction of Salisbury Road, which is only slightly um, above the line of the uh, railway, it takes 15 minutes to get from there to the traffic lights. Um, so the idea of a two minutes delay, even if there isn't very much of a tailback, is significantly longer than has been indicated in the documentation. There has been no substantial suggestion about how this junction can be improved. Um, over and above some minor adjustments to the junction itself, which we've already heard about, um, they might help, but they're not going to address the fundamental problem. All vehicular access between the BA1 site and the town centre must pass through this junction, either from the north or from the east, if they use the northern link road. Or even the southern link road, if they try to avoid that junction altogether, um, and we have further issues of uh, traffic passing through the new areas to the south of, of the town. Um, we've also mentioned earlier that that junction itself has some um, buildings, of, uh, some old buildings which um, impact the, the size of that uh, junction and what actually can be done to, to relieve the problem. Turning on to the link roads themselves, neither the north link road or the south link road um, that have been included in the local plan are going to alleviate the serious traffic congestion that will result from building on the scale that is proposed. The roads are being suggested to serve two purposes which are incompatible. As access roads for residents and as bypasses to divert through traffic away from the town centre. These roads pass right through the middle of the new residential areas. They cannot serve both these purposes without jeopardising the safety and health of residents living nearby. The recent planning application from HCC, which I know we have to not take in its entirety, has sought to resolve that issue, but has actually illustrated the difficulty of designing a workable solution. We believe that at this point in time, there is no demonstrable solution to that traffic issue. There has been some overemphasis on the assumption that residents will walk or cycle to the town centre. This is commendable aspiration, but not a practical solution to the issue and cannot be dictated to the residents. They will still use their cars. I'm sure one of the attractive features of building so many houses in Bulldog is the availability of the train station. Again, whilst it's great to encourage more walking and cycling to the station, even parts of the BA1 site will be far enough away from the station to prompt less mobile people to take their cars. This will increase yet further the pressures on North Road approaching the town. The station approach road junction with the station road is already suffering the impact of the recently added houses on the corner of Icknield Way East and Station Road. The station itself and its access would require huge improvements to cope with a probable increase in commuter traffic. So in conclusion, um, we believe that a detailed study of the local traffic implications of developing BA1 should be completed before the land is assessed as deliverable. 
Moving on to the next um, point, um, the proposed housing allocations are not justified in terms of the likely impacts of the development. Um, this is mainly to do with air quality um, and the fact that Bulldog sits in a bowl and that the air is likely to think. I'm not going to go any, into more, any more of that, just so we note that that, that is the <coughs> issue that sits on, under there. Just finally, to address whether it's an appropriate option to build this number of houses in Bulldog. The extent of BA1 site has been increased significantly in order to mop up housing allocations that have not been considered appropriate elsewhere in the region. Over the last three local plan proposals, the allocation for BA1 has risen hugely from 419 to 2,800. Bulldog is not the ideal place for this extent of housing as it is a distance away from the local employment areas around Stevenage and Hitchin and it will put additional stress on local roads as people travel to and from their place of work. In conclusion, given the difficulties of delivering the housing within Bulldog, we believe that BA1 is not deliverable in the plan period, and that locations nearer to the centres of employment should be revisited. The plans for a new settlement should be expedited in preference to trying to deliver such a large-scale development within Bulldog, and um, it should be considered whether meeting the full objectively obsessed need, obsessed, assessed need is practical or necessary. Thank you. Mr. Hemmings. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to go on for some time, um, I'm afraid, partly because I've got a lot of questions now to ask about the answers that were given earlier uh, by way of cross-examination. But I'll start. Uh, um, yeah, I, just on, on that, I would say, you know, uh, asking the council questions can sometimes be helpful, but generally only to a point. Um, what is most important for me um, is that um, I don't leave this room in any doubt about what you think. Um, that, that, that's the important purpose, really, of these hearings. You all know that. So, so, that, I know, <laughs> so that I know full well what you think. Um, you know, I, I could sit here and allow people to cross-examine the council um, all, all day, which um, isn't the purpose of the hearing. It's only, it's only in, in by way of questioning the, uh, the truth or the disillusion of, of some of the answers we heard, that's all. And other people have already raised it, so I may just skip it. Well, I'll, I'll you know... I'll, we'll see how we go. You can I, always I'm stop. I'm prepared to see how it goes. And if, it, if it's not proving helpful yeah. to me, yeah. um, then, then I'll, I'll move you on. Okay, that's great. Happy to do that. Um, I'm not a planner. I have no planning experience. Uh, I read all the paperwork that I can find. find it quite confusing. But I have the experience of life. I was born in the North London suburbs, so I know city life. I've worked um, in Stevenage from 18 to 30, so as an aerospace engineer. I lived by the Thames uh, in a small village as a kid for quite a big chunk of my life. I also lived in Milton Keynes, which I thought was the best new town I've ever uh, lived in. Stevenage was terrible by comparison. Uh, and I read this plan, which is basically creating a, a new town in Bulldog, and I think this is no way to build a new town. This is just going to be a disaster. I've been a scout leader here for 27 years, and uh, I've been a Rotarian for 15, and the scout group is the biggest in the area. Uh, people are very generous, they're very friendly, community-minded, and we're terrified that this is going to be destroyed by what you're going to put in here. I'm here because I believe the local plan will irrevocably damage the social structures of the town, the environment and the sense of community. We're small enough to know a big percentage of the people live here and we're big enough to get things done on our own because the councils don't help much. <coughs> and as I said earlier, I, I'm here because I believe Bulldog is worth fighting for. Once I settled here, I started my own company, uh, mostly doing business turnarounds. Uh, so I know a business plan when I see one, 
I know a good business plan, and I know one that stinks. And to be frank, I read this as a business plan, and I think it stinks. It's riddled with political maneuverings between the HS HCC and the NHDC, uh, and is a disaster from any planning process because it leads to undue influence being put on the wrong things. This plan isn't visionary, it's plodding and procedural, and the result is illusionary. The plan, <coughs> the BA1 site concerns everybody. It's a site too far. It will be an eyesore. It'd be no dreaming spires, no broad avenues, no broad partners, no beautiful heartland. And I think YWG have done a, a, great, a great job of producing a pretty picture. But it will end up, having read some of the detail behind it, with the density of housing as a hodgepodge of small boxes rounding on one another, like LA. And if you've ever been there, you wouldn't want to be there. Bisec but it will be bisected by a link road, which, to be frank, will induce a lot of traffic to go through uh, that part of town. You know, people know there's going to be a bottleneck in the centre of Bulldog. Anybody who wants to go left, it's not a great number of people, they will go left. But what's going to happen? Oh, nice new road. Uh, we will all go down that way instead of going the right way down the Bulldog bypass. Uh, I've already seen uh, two kids killed in the town by traffic and one of my scouts was severely brain injured uh, just near that railway bridge. Uh, I don't want to see any more of this if I can avoid it. Um, I won't mention the pollution because we'll, that will be dealt with later. Uh, furthermore, Hitchin, Arlesey, Stockfold, Letchworth and Bulldog are becoming one sprawling conurbation, just like LA again. It's, uh, it's something we should be avoiding. Products, politi politics is working against bulldockings. They don't like it and will fight back as they have in the past. It's not democratic in a normal sense. We've had, you know, uh, all of our councillors have been censured when they voted against this plan in order to force it through because we're totally outnumbered. I look around and there aren't many people here from uh, from Bulldog, uh, because, well, we've had these consultations in the past. Citizens have turned out in their hundreds, filled the gymnasium at the local uh, sports centre a couple of times, and been largely ignored. They've at times been laughed at, and they've certainly been talked down to. But we have been politically outmanoeuvred, as I say. Uh, we don't have much respect for the leadership of this plan, I'll be frank with you. Uh, he knows so little about Bulldog. He said in one of the public meetings, Bulldog has been chosen for expansion because they hadn't been touched before in earlier plans. And people gasped like we laughed this morning. Hundreds of new houses in Clothal Common seem to have completely escaped his notice. Um, earlier consultations to be frank, have only corrected obvious plan errors. I've been here before in management terms. They put in deliberate mistakes so they can say they've consulted and then they take them out. Uh, things like BA10. Now BA indicates to me it's a housing area but it's actually an industrial proposal now because initially that was put in as housing and they've left the number the same. Um, simply because that was an easy thing to change. They knew they'd have to change it anyway because there was no provision for jobs in the town. Our biggest employer is Tesco's. Our second biggest employer is a secondary school. Um, you know, this is going to be a complete dormitory town with people travelling to London unless something is done to generate jobs. But people say, fat chance of that. Um, it's... Uh, they haven't managed to do it in the past. Why should they now? Um, in fact, one of the sites that they're proposing we build on uh, is currently uh, an industrial site, which is um, BA6. It was Gasworks when I first came here. It's, it is a bit better now. Uh, not much. Um, the only reason I'm here, uh, to be frank, is because... 
Our councillors have said that you are our last resort and you're the only one who can recommend modifications to the plan to make it workable or even throw it out. They expect you, the people that is, to have the courage to step up to the plate and be the voice of the people. Regretfully, some think you won't have the balls to throw it out or even do much more than rubber stamp it. They've almost given up, but not quite, because there's a few of them here today. I have some fundamental questions about this plan. The housing need is not, in my mind, properly defined. It's based on stats from uh, ORS, based, which are in turn based on ONS numbers. Uh, and ONS themselves say their numbers shouldn't be used to forecast the future, interestingly. The ONS figures are based on a peak of bubbling growth in London. Uh, the ONS recent figures showed a 30% fall in immigration since the plan was finalised as a result of Brexit negotiations. A major driver of people moving in, uh, into London and this area. This hasn't been taken into account, and I guess it can't be because it's happened recently. But it shows you how variable these uh, housing needs are. Um, the plan need is fundamentally flawed in my mind because it absorbs Stevenage and Luton's unmet need without question. It hypothesises need will be driven by Stevenage in the first half of the plan as we're nearly halfway through the plan period, incidentally, um, it then says that the hypothesis is that the second half of the cycle will mirac miraculously, in some way, be driven by the rest of rural North Hearts District Council, where industry, to be frank, seems to have shrunk in recent years as we've built steadily on top of our, uh, our industrial areas in Letchworth. And it also completely ignores neighbouring local plans because it focuses on Steamledge and Luton, not on what's happening just outside. For instance, there's a plan for a thousand houses in Henlow Camp, a thousand plus actually, I've heard very high figures there. Stockfold has built a thousand, which is just about two miles north of us. Um, Stockfold has already built over a 1,000 houses, according to a councillor there, uh, since 2010, are planning a further 400. Fairfield Gardens, an estate which has been built up in recent times uh, in uh, Letchworth, is also planning another 300 there. Biggleswade, village east of Biggleswade, um, I've noted, is planning 1,500 houses, Arlsey East, 2,000. Arlsey Cross, 1,000 to 1,400. And that totals to me, counting everything up, between 8,300 and 8,800 house, new houses coming along, um, which are within very close travel of our employment areas. So I really do question whether the housing requirement so housing need is what it is. Also question whether, it, when it came to settling on a housing requirement, whether the council should have said, we need to leave some of the housing need unmet because it will cause unacceptable negative effects, e.g. loss of green belt, serious environmental damage, damage to social structures, etc., it's not cowardice that they do not do that. Self-interest also plays a big part. And why do I say that? Well, actually, this building program in Bulldog, on BA1, I was sitting down talking to an estate agent friend of mine, and he said, well, that number of houses, HCC should expect to make well in excess of £300 million for the building land. Uh, and the other building areas within Bulldog that they own the land on will make them in excess of 80. This is a very conservative figure, £100,000 a plot. Um, you know, if, when you consider building four bedroom houses, the margin on selling a plot of land for a four bedroom house is about 350000 at present. 
Uh, there's a lot of money involved in this, and we suspect it would not be reinvested back into Bulldog. Uh, it certainly only cost £40 million to build the bypass in 2008. So, um, you know, what a, building the new bypass road that everybody puts so much faith in um, is, um, in my judgment, uh, just a small bit, small change. We also, uh, well, I have to say I was very cynical about the discussion about alternative sites that have been turned down. Um, we know, because we were involved in a discussion with our MP, uh, that um, it would, they hadn't given any consideration to building a small new town between Bulldock and Royston. Um, we felt that the need, if it was actually a true need, uh, would be more sensibly met by building there because there's only a small hamlet there, to be frank. But there is a railway station which has access to London. It's the next station up the line. We colloquially named this Odsey New Country Town. The benefits of building there would have been that the land isn't green built. Uh, it's low grade land, whereas BA1 is the highest grade corn belt that you could imagine. Uh, much of it is grassland. Uh, they would be able to build a coherent structure to the town rather than bolting half a town on the side of Bulldog. Uh, Groundwater is available, and it certainly isn't here. Uh, they have a railway station that currently serves many fewer people. The area could be south of the A505, halfway between Bulldog and Royston. All they need to do is manage the purchase of the land. Their excuse for not pursuing that idea was it would take 15 years to buy the land. How inept. The founding fathers of Letchworth Garden City bought all the land they needed on one day after a few weeks of negotiation. And that allowed them to actually plan out the city of Letchworth, which in, uh, in modern day terms, a hundred years later nearly, is being talked about as a, a shining beacon of good town planning. Although I have to say, Letchworth is at its limit now. I um, don't know whether I'm allowed to say the next bit. Um, if you're unsure, the answer's probably not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll take out the words I was going to use, and I'll just read from the middle of the sentence. The plan is really driven by money. Both NHDC and HCC have a major financial interest in building Bulldog as quickly as possible. And I do like to see a business plan that has the money to actually spend to make it work. But there are so many fundamental flaws with this plan, I think we really need to, uh, we need, really need to question it. I, uh, somebody said that um, NHDC will get their money from uh, central government. Certainly, I worked out HCC would make an immense amount of money, which I mentioned earlier. I hope it's enough. I've seen councillors wasting money quite frequently. Um, I do ask the question, why can't 60 million or 80 million for the houses within the trapped area of Bulldog be enough for what they want to do? I suspect they'll blow the money somewhere, <laughs> somewhere else in the county. Um, I would suggest what they do is they put aside some of their housing need and think about fulfilling it in the next period of the plan and take the time to acquire land where they can build something to take the best of the Garden City concept forward uh, as Howard did. Uh, take the ideas of Prince Charles about building a modern town and build a country town where the footprint is distributed so everyone is a short walk from open farmland and countryside like we are at present with the minimum loss of agriculture. It would be quite easily easy to do, but you need a bit of vision for that. Um, when we campaigned for the East-West Bypass, 
Bulldog was a terrible traffic jam, constantly, day and night. We knew there would be some trap land. That, in our minds, gave us organic growth. We didn't think they'd blow it all in 13 years, the remainder of the plan. I think it's just that they need the money, and that's what's driving them. We rely on planning rules to avoid a blot on the landscape, like the Jackman's estate in Letchworth. But we can, we can have some influence on that with neighbourhood planning. So we can prob whatever they do decide to build, we can probably have some, some say in it. Plus, also, we also have some good councillors for doing those things. <coughs> Firmly believe that NHDC planning are incapable of visionary planning. And they're being bullied in, into this by the HCC. Well, I, I'm, surprisingly. I'm, going, I'm going to, going to move on there. You can delete there. that part, Ken. Yes. Um, <coughs> I'd say the need isn't justified. Uh, most of it is on Greenbelt land. We have a serious water problem. Our river has been dry for over two years, and it is a chalk stream. There is a flooding risk, which was skated over earlier. I've seen flood plans which will inundate Black Horse Farm. Uh, and I don't know where they've gone, but uh, I, I couldn't find a copy last night when I was looking for it. We have a very poor road infrastructure. When we built the byway, we were told that um, people would be discouraged from using Bulldog as a rut run, rat run uh, by, by controlling the traffic flow through Bulldog, actually to slow it down. What very quickly happened was they put in linked traffic lights uh, so that the end of uh, Jubilee Road, uh, Western Way, and the Bulldog traffic lights uh, are all now linked so as to bring the traffic supposedly through the town very quickly but the end result of that has been that, that from well somebody said 7.30 I don't get up there early nowadays often uh, that that is solid with traffic uh, there is insufficient rail infrastructure there's serious air pollution which we'll deal with later um, and I don't believe we have sufficient labour given what's been going on recently locally, to actually build this town that they're talking about. They just won't, will not be able to achieve it. And what I fear is that the plan will roll over. So we'll give approval for BA1. It will stay as part of the plan, even though it's unlikely to be built by 2031. And instead of planning for a new town, which would alleviate some of these problems, um, we will... Um, end up with just continuing to build on BA1. Excuse my cynicism early, but I must repeat it, because several people spoke to me earlier. Somebody spoke of a three-minute delay at the traffic lights. Um, a friend of mine lives uh, nearly a mile from those traffic lights, and he said in the break, Three days a week, it's out to my house. Two days a week in the rush hour, it's just short of my house. And I know it. you get about 150 yards of traffic through per traffic light change, which I reckon is about two minutes. So if you're lucky, it's at least half an hour, several days a week, to get through to the traffic lights. It's an appalling problem. But I, I say again, if we alleviate that with a link road, that will induce more traffic to drive through this new estate which is being proposed. I, would ask, I have lots of questions about these traffic lights you intend to put in because they've been a total failure uh, in the past. Does anybody know what percentage gain is to be of throughput is to be made by such traffic lights? Because I've seen the people, I can see the traffic lights at the bottom of Western Way from my toilet. And I get up at uh, seven in the morning often, 
and I see the traffic lights working, I can see the traffic is jammed. And I see people working on those regularly, resetting them, and they don't work. They still don't work. You st it's still 10 minutes to get from my house, which is 100 yards from uh, the Hitchin Road. So, okay. My apologies. Can you bear with me a moment, Mr. Ennis? Oh, right. Um, just, can you read my writing? Yes, just about. Um, a, a public service announcement. Um, if uh, the owner of a Skoda Octavia uh, registration um, SJ56VTK is here, could you move your car, please? Because it's causing all sorts of mayhem in the car park. Well, it's blocking everybody in the car park. I'll... Um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that with you. Thank you. Thank you. Apologies, Mr. Hemmings. It's okay. Um, but if you probably need to have a little scout around Bulldog. Uh, it's Bulldog used to be a brewing town. A lot of the old t old buildings in the town are related to brewing. The one on that traffic light junction. That makes make skating around it rather more tempting. <laughs> we have, we have, I think, still 13 pubs in the town, which is unusual for a town of 10,000 people. Doesn't mean we're all drunkards, by the way. Um, but there is also a medieval building on that corner, which has been hit several times by lorries trying to turn left, despite the fact there's a giant bronze bell on the corner. Uh, we have regularly had lorries jammed under the railway bridge, and in fact, the solution to that has been <laughs> to, <laughs> to actually reinforce the bridge, which is something in industry I would absolutely fight normally. I'd say, no, just solve the problem of the traffic going through. But it seems to be insol insolvable by common sense. Um, I asked the question, you know, to us, the obvious thing is to widen the road going out to Letchworth Gate so as to make that a fast route through to the A1 and the A505. Um, but we've been told that people don't like that idea in Letchworth, therefore you're not going to do it. Is that, wouldn't that have been a more sensible thing rather than build a road that isn't going to work in Bulldog uh, to take the pressure out of Bulldog? Has anybody on the NHDC got an answer to that? Um. Assuming you're not, I'll carry on. Does anybody know? Is, is that something that you say would be necessary to render this plan sound? I'm, I'm going to ask you to um, to focus um, on the soundness um, of this plan because that, that, that's the only thing that's within my control. I, I understand that there are um, other issues um, as well, um, but some of those may not be um, soundness issues for, for this plan. It might be that you tell me that they are, um, but if you can really concentrate on the soundness of this plan and what changes um, you think are necessary to it. Well, I've, I've, the major one to me is whether the housing need is correctly specified given that it's built on the needs of Luton and Stevenage and North Hearts, it ignores yeah. what's happening in central beds, which will have a major, or provide a, a, a solution. So I think they're just over-provisioning land. And I think the, the motivation for that is financial greed. Um, so that's I, one big issue to me. I have, I have noted your point um, about need. Um, I'm not going to dwell on that today, though, because we've, I've already um, spent already a very long need. time um, ta talking about need, but the I, need. I'd yes. ask you to put it in your in your head. Uh, I will talk to you about transport, traffic tyres, and how close some of these places are, as far as meeting that need is concerned. Uh, there was also uh, talk about. Um, This uh, link road, it goes through the BA1 site. Now, I, when, I, when I questioned this on 
consultation. I was told, well, it will be a 30 mile an hour speed limit area. However, if it's going to be a fast route for traffic and a lot more induced traffic than is currently coming down the A507, um, I think it's going to be a major safety hazard for children in the BA1 area. There's a real serious safety risk there. I also am concerned that people in Ashwell are complaining that they won't be able to get into Bulldog because of the induced flows. accept wholeheartedly that they will be able to plug schools and housing and surgeries and community hall local shops because they surely can't cost that much uh, but we're told there's no flooding risk is that true uh, there's a very large area of land on BA1 it's uh, about half a mile by a quarter of a mile I've seen in the last year, Bulldog High Street's been flooded in, uh, in a storm. Uh, it's also been flooding in Letchworth. And if we have something like 100,000 tonnes of water trying to flush out into the River Ivel, then I'm sure we're going to have flooding here. I just question whether that work has been done. Um, people mentioned corn buntings on the wildlife issues. Uh, are they aware there are partridge, English partridges on that land as well? Um, I know because I've seen them. Uh, there are also badger sets and badgers have a large area to roam in normally. Uh, a friend has badgers in his garden and there are badgers just to the north of the site. It's a lot more than is, uh, is understood going on in Bulldog by people who just pop over occasionally. made a note, any special measures to compensate people? How much is, is there actually a budget for what you're doing? How much money is being put aside to, in your, you must, when you put a business plan like this together, have an idea of where you're going to spend the money, not just where you're going to get the money. Um, there's a lot of things to have money spent on, and do you, do you have a budget for them? Um, um, what, what sort of thing do you have in mind, Mr Hemmings? Uh, well, provision of schools, provision of services. I would just like to think that these people, when they're producing it, they're just not thinking of the money they're getting, but what money they're going to have to spend. You know, what's the price of producing these roads that they, they talk of throwing in? They never talk to us about those things. Um, we talked earlier, or you spoke earlier in your questioning, about... Um, which, which green belt have been excluded? Um, and I was sort of surprised by the answer. Um, I thought that the site west of Western Way had been excluded, which is heritage land, incidentally. I thought the Green King's land had been excluded. Uh, I thought the Northerns, they're the far large farmers, then. Uh, around Bulldog, I thought some of their land that they'd offered had been excluded. I certainly heard them say in a public meeting they were offered, they were prepared to put up land, and the response was, "We don't need it, thanks." Um, again, maybe that's the money motivation of that. That was in a public meeting. West of Western Way could be ideal for southbound traffic because people who wanted to go south towards London or Stevenage or whatever would have almost immediate access. To, uh, to the A1 there. Um, and yeah, we are highly constrained by Greenbelt. I just think some of the options have been hidden and I worry about the motivations. 
Um, yeah, I, I, I want to move away from um, this point um, that you are now beginning to um, ram home time and time again about um, right. mo mo motivation. That, that is not a matter of soundness, and, and it is an area, Mr. Hemmings, where you right. would need to be careful. Right, okay. Um. I would like to make the point that um, I've just jumped to check. I, I need to just regather my thoughts. Um, green belt really is, is a major concern. The land on BA1 was compulsory purchased as small holdings to train young farmers back in the early 20th century. Agriculture is still our second biggest industry economically. And we hear on TV regularly that young farmers can't get started. HCC seemed to have made pitiful attempts to actually use that land for that purpose. Simply, they've been it out, letting it out to the, near, the largest landowner, largely. Um, it is prime agricultural farmland. It used to be a brewing town. The, in the Victorian times, the richest man in Hertfordshire lived in Church Street, just along the road from me. And uh, in one generation, managed by 34 farms with the quality of the barley they grew here for brewing. Um, I'm not a great fan of monocultural farming, but I have to accept it puts dinner on the table and it also pro provides a habitat for corn buntings. And to be frank, if you'd seen that piece of land last year covered in wheat on a strong windy day, you would have been reminded by a Van Gogh cornfield painting. It was beautiful. Waves of golden ears shimmering the sun rolling up the hillside. That alone clinched its natural environmental value to me and would have done to anybody else who was passing that day. When that, I've already said that land will become a serious flood risk in my mind. And last year, the reason Letchworth flooded was because Letchworth, uh, NHDC failed to clear land drains, uh, but Bulldog High Street flooded anyway. All of our road runoff runs into the River Ival, and it goes through as a spate. You have, have it like two days ago, we had a lot of rain. Uh, it rushes through, and I go down to see the Ival. Now, the Ival is a chalk stream. Uh, there aren't many of them around, and it floods through, and the next day, the riverbed is dry. It's just, you know, the plans are pretty, but they don't actually hold together. And the town, somebody said earlier, will be separated by the railway. That railway is on a high embankment. It will be separated. It's not one of these things, the, tra the railway is not just charging along in a cutting. It's a high, it's a high embankment which will split the town off. Cloth of Common is only just getting integrated into the town. And... Uh, now, I can see in 30, 40 years' time, there'll still be a problem with uh, BA1 being a separate town. Um, if you're not already near it, uh, Mr. Hemmings, I'm going to ask you to um, draw to a close now, if you, if you yeah, would. I'm just going to talk about the environment, because I'm heavily involved in environment locally. Uh, yeah, sure, but um, I, I have given you an awful lot of time. Um, so um, if, if you can um, just make your final points very concisely and in a, in a punchy fashion. I, will do. I can leave you a copy of what I was going to read. How about that? Save you time. You can read fast and I can talk. There are only 200 chalk streams in the world and the river, the river Ival, well, actually, Hertfordshire has custody of a lot of them. They don't seem to care for them. Abstraction is, is wiping them out. Every one of them, uh, the the mimram, the bean, the ash, the rib, the stalk, they're all diminished greatly. Um, the worst case, actually, is the Ivo system. The Ivo starts in Boulder. It used to start in my road in Victorian times until they built the railway. It now should start, and used to start when I came to this town, in the springs area of Bulldog. There was a lake and several springs. Um, the Ivor system includes tributaries of the Purwell, the His, the Orwell, the Picks, and the Flit. They still run, but the Ivor, for the first half mile, has had no flow for two years now. The only flow that goes through it is untreated road runoff, which is polluted, mildly polluted stuff. 
Um, that, you know, you do not replace those environments. There's 200 of them in the world, and that's five starting in Bulldog. And nobody seems to care. Affinity Water have no reservoirs for delivering water to their population. They do it all by abstraction. And it sucks down in the chalk until the water stops flowing. It started to stop flowing 15 years ago. It was always flowing when I first came to the town. It's a chalk stream. It's a very, very rare environment. Nobody gives a damn. We've spoken to Affinity Water and they make stories up. Um, at one stage, um, they admitted that when things are bad in the river that starts and runs through Cambridge at Ashwell, they pump water out of the chalk in the Ival catchment into the Cam catchment. Environmentally, that is a disaster. It just makes, it, makes everything worse. It would be nice if the river could run again. If we put another 7,500 people in Bulldog, which is what we're talking about, and all of that sewage is being treated in Letchworth, going into a brook there, it will never, re never reappear. It will drain down for at least a mile. It's currently half a mile dry. Uh, the other problem they have is that treated water, that sewage, treated sewage, goes through uh, Stotfold, and they regularly flood houses in Stotfold um, as a result of water running out of there. And that's because the water running out of there is rich and it runs straight through their housing area and blocks up the drains. It's a nonsense river manager, uh, management approach. As I mentioned, the, the, the water is polluted. Uh, litter in the area is uh, disgraceful, despite the money that's spent on it. But I gather that we are actually going to get a new rubbish dump move from Letchworth to Bulldog, which is fun. Are, are, you, are, are you nearing your destination, Mr. Hemmings? I am. I don't need to repeat what's been said on transport, no. except what I, to reinforce what I said about uh, these conurbations nearby satisfying Stevenage is housing need. Border to Stevenage is 15 minutes off peak. Bunting to, for to Stevenage, where there's a load of houses being built, over a thousand houses being built there, uh, is 20 minutes away. Bunting to, for ha to Harlow, incidentally, in East Hertfordshire, is 27 minutes away. It's even further away. Uh, Stockfold to Stevenage is only 17 minutes away. Henlow to Stevenage is 20 minutes away. And Arlesley to Stevenage is 18 minutes away. There are thousands of houses being built there, more than satisfying the need for North Hertfordshire. And people are not stupid. The housing there is cheaper. They will move there and travel to Stevenage. So why are we putting so much money? Oh, we're not putting money in, sorry. Why are we doing so much to get houses into Bulldog? I have a whole section on rail travel and stuff like that, but I'll leave you to read that. And uh, also employment, which I'm most dissatisfied with. Yeah, I think the plan, the plan stinks, and it, there's so many reasons why it will not work. And the fundamental things like where will they get the labourers to build all these number of houses in an area which is being built like crazy, just over the border and other parts? How many houses have we actually built in the last seven years? I don't know. Not many compared to the number you plan to build. Are you going to suddenly magic build us from nowhere? It's not a viable plan. It's a nonsense. On that note, I'll finish. Thank you, Mr Hemmings. Um, yes, just one thing that um, I, I want to be clear about. 
um, is that um, I do this job um, without fear or favour. Um, and um, whatever I say in my report, whether it is that I agree with you or whether I agree with the council, um, I can reassure you that it will be what I genuinely think and there will be no rubber stamping. Mr Baker. Thanks, sir. I will um, endeavour to be um, as brief as I was yesterday um, in relation to Letchworth. And obviously one or two of the things uh, I will say effectively mirror what we said about development of proposals in Letchworth because they're common to all the major allocations. But I did want to address two aspects of the proposals um, in Baldock and in particular obviously on BA1. Um, and they are effectively on the impacts of the development itself as proposed and secondly on the green belt implications. And um, I'm pleased that I've heard that there are that the, the practical aspects of the implications of the development in terms of their impacts have been raised by uh, people who live in and represent the, the local community because it's something that's more or less, it seems to me, completely absent from the council's documents in terms of the reality of what the consequences will be of a development of this scale on the town. Um, I live in Buntingford, which has just been mentioned and the impacts on the town are, are making the town council there tear their hair out, even though only a small proportion of the thousand, over a thousand houses that have just been given permission have been built. But it's all sorts of indirect and unexpected consequences, like it rained the other day and all of a sudden there's sewage flooding on a key junction in the middle of the town centre, which of course the assessment said wouldn't happen, but everybody knew would. Um, it's the traffic, there isn't adequate car parking in the town, um, uh, the, real, the, the, the facilities in the town are being stretched in terms of their capability to cope. All of those things with a relatively small proportion of a thousand or say I think it's 1200 have been permitted and I, I suspect about 400 built. Now we're talking about something completely different here, we're talking about two, uh, this site alone, two, 2800 houses proposals collectively over three and a half thousand on a small town and, and I think it would be that, you know it's, it's helpful to have the plan attached to the council's statement which just demonstrates the sheer scale of the area that will be subsumed into the settlement boundary as a result of the, these proposals collectively and, and you can see I mean look at it visually it looks as if it's about doubling the size in fact I don't think it's intended to quite do that and it's clearly not far off and and clearly those impacts have to be factored into into, uh, into the 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 balancing exercise in terms of impacts against benefits and and I'm not sure there is anywhere where you can go sir to see those but I think you've heard a number of statements that will help you reach a conclusion about that um, but I did just want to point out two examples of the, the, the attitude which of the council which seems to be well we'll allocate the site and then we'll leave others to clear up the implications and the, and the one I hadn't heard about wasn't aware of until this morning was this, the corn bunting well we've heard well that there's a plan there's a policy in the plan which means that that will have to be addressed by the developer or landowner but surely any land allocation in a plan must be demonstrated to be deliverable and in terms of deliverable deliverability on corn bunting where is the landowner where is a commitment from a landowner provide to provide additional land over and above what currently exists which isn't corn bunting habitat for corn buntings equivalent to the area being lost I haven't seen anything in any anything produced by the county council 
the council may get a sum of money to put forward, to put together and to help them, say the Hearts and Middlesex Wildlife Trust to provide habitat or someone else. But is that, the, the council haven't demonstrated that that's realistic. The, the, the traffic issue, um, as I say, I live in Buntingford and I spend quite a lot of time on the A507, which runs from the A10, A10 in East Hertfordshire to the A1 via Bulldog. It's a very important road. It's the only one of the very few east-west A-class roads across the area. It's a nightmare to drive because of its configuration. But it's extremely heavily used because it is one of the very few routes linking the A10 and the A1. And, the, and there's a campaign now to get that deep scale down, but that's not going to get very far because there are no realistic alternatives to using it. That traffic on that is only going to increase, not least because of things like the scale of development in Buntingford, but also the fact um, that there is a lot of development going on in the, in the vicinity, as Mr Hemmings has told us about. So those, that junction that we've talked about, the traffic light junction, the bottleneck, is crucial to whether or not this, this, this scheme can go ahead. And it's not acceptable just for the traffic modelling to say, oh, yeah, well, there's an average delay here, therefore it doesn't matter. This is a major problem which the, the normal physical solutions to do not exist in this location because, not least, of the listed buildings on the, on the corner. The only thing you can do is either improve the, 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 the th through flow by fiddling with the traffic lights, which will get, get you a marginal gain, or provide an alternative route. And that alternative route, in its own right, will cause other problems, because I can see, I can see myself, if I'm coming down into Bulldock, and I see the queue ahead down Clottle Road into into Bulldock, backing back, coming back from the traffic lights, I'm certainly going to go round this new bypass which is going to be created called the Southern Link Road. I'm certainly going to use it. Um, because, but, and that will create additional problems that we've heard about. It's not good that you effectively you're constructing a, uh, another bypass through, a resi through residential areas just to avoid that junction. So I'm not sure about the viability in terms of this is an issue. And can I just point out, sir, that this, certainly on the traffic front, we're not talking in isolation here about one, just BA1, we're talking about BA10. Now, BA10 is a very large industrial area, we're told, being built for the benefit of Stevenage. You know, this is, you know, Stevenage uh, uh, w were very keen that North Hearts allocate that area because it can't provide all the industrial land it needs in its own area. Well, if that's surely that's going to generate traffic, new traffic between Stevenage and Bulldog, which will okay come up the A1 and then off into that industrial area. But where are the people working there coming from? They're all going to be new people on the local road network, and a lot of those, if I live in that industrial area, I quite might fancy going to the pub in Bulldog at some point. Well, I'm not going to walk in there, am I? So. Um, I'm going to be taking the car and my friends in there. And so all of these issues are, I think, demonstrate the fact that the council hasn't really taken on board what are all the, uh, the, uh, the implications of allocating this land in terms, of its terms of the impact to determine whether they're acceptable or not. And then, and then of course, you, it added to those practical aspects, you've got the visual and landscape ones. And... I would remind you, sir, about what we've been told today. In fact, the, I think it's CG16A, which is the document setting out the, the landscape characteristics and the sensitivity. And I think um, the council this morning pointed out that, yes, this is, there is high sensitivity of this landscape, um, particularly as you get to the higher levels, to, to the north of the site such that the council itself is suggesting scaling back the extent of that built area to below the ridge. But I'd like you, sir, to draw your own conclusion by doing something very simple, and that's on a nice clear day, hopefully, driving up to, on the A507 towards Buntingford, driving to the top, 
um, finding there is one safe place, I think, to turn around and then drive back down gently and view for yourself the views across to the ridge, that ridge that we're talking about. It's very clear in the landscape. Um, you'll see the, the town itself nestling in the valley. You'll see the church very clearly. And you will see that there are some buildings. You will just see the rooftops of the Clothall a common estate. Uh, and then you will see land behind. And that is the land that the council says uh, that should be built on. And you will see that it extends outwards from the town significantly. And I'd like you to imagine, sir, that that, that development with the industrial land in, in the forefront, this side of it, the, the closer to you, with God knows what scale of buildings on. They're going to be industrial. I doubt if they're all going to be single storey. So imagine this, the, the impact on that landscape from that vantage point of that wonderful... You come down, there, there are wonderful views as you come down off that scarp slope on the road of downland countryside. And beyond, and beyond the town, these, this, this ridged, rolling <coughs> landscape, which is completely open, and I think you will agree that this is highly sensitive. And I'm hoping, sir, you will conclude that the impact... <coughs> is going to be extremely significant visually and in landscape terms on that area. But I, uh, I'm happy to rely entirely on your, own, uh, your, your views of that, so rather than trying to demonstrate in any other way what that impact will be. So that's, they're really my concerns in terms of impacts. And of course, in reaching a conclusion about the acceptability of this, this allocation, you, you then have to look at the green belt aspects which are only to a very slight um, extent overlapping. And, and of course, what the council's documents reveal is that the, this, this area also contributes to a certain level to meeting the purposes. And the council have presented a document, or they have carried out a review, their consultants have carried out a review, which show that the overall contribution to the, to, of this area to the Greenbelt is actually significant, at least in respect, in each case, in each parcel, to at least two of the, the um, purposes of the Greenbelt. And as I said yesterday in respect of Letchworth, sir, that the council cannot claim that if it only meets two of the purposes, and not the others, therefore the, the overall contribution is less. That is, not, that is not an acceptable way of carrying out a Greenbelt review in terms of using that sort of scoring system to, to claim significance. If the, the, there would be a significant impact as a result of one um, purpose of the Greenbelt, then the impact is significant. And uh, this as I said yesterday, sir, has been pointed out, and the reference again is at Peter Brett Associates' report to the council, uh, HOU8. What the council has said in there, they accept, they say that there may be small bits of it don't, don't uh, maybe contribute less, but that is not the point. In terms of the methodology, if one, if one purpose of the green belt is compromised significantly, then the impact of the development is significant. And that is the approach that the council should have adopted. And it, to my mind, definitely applies to this area. Which, so, so you then, so which brings you to, and I was listening this morning and not quite aghast, but I'm thinking, well, for goodness sake, why is this site being proposed at all, given the scale of these impacts? And if you take them all together, the site-specific, the community, and all the other impacts that we're talking about, plus the impacts on the Greenbelt. And so I thought, well the, well, the answer will be given. The council's statement in terms of, well, impacts on the Greenbelt, I'll look at the council's statement in terms of impact on um, uh, exceptional circumstances and the justification for this. And what, and what is it? It runs to four, parts, four short paragraphs, only one of which actually relates to BA1. And the, 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 in terms of Greenbelt, the council simply say, well, we have this level of need to meet, um, therefore we have to develop all these sites because there are no alternatives. Well, surely that just 
that is not, as we've made the case before, that is not the only consideration which applies. The council is required to take into account the consequences of the development and then see if they outweigh the, the, the need to provide for housing because that's what NPPF paragraph 14 says and in this case there are two arms to that um, criterion in paragraph 14. There's, it says development um, should, uh, should, uh, needs should be met unless the impacts, uh, the benefits outweigh the impacts or and, um, and, and then the second part of it, if other policies of the, plan, uh, of the NPPF uh, apply, and in this case, clearly, the, um, that, the, that, the, the, the footnote nine criteria include Greenbelt. So the council have to add those two considerations together and then weigh them about against housing need. And to my mind, the, alloc the proposed allocation of this particular site demonstrates that the council have failed overall to consider whether or not it should be providing for the overall scale of development that the plan uh, is, is proposing um, on the basis that it's, it, uh, our total need requires this site to be released. Uh, there is... N n the, the, there is no indication in relation to this particular site at Baldock that that has been a consideration in determining whether or not this should be released. And, and, it, it, is, and, and it is frustrating when um, the, only, the, the only thing we hear is, well, it's a foregone conclusion, you have to meet all the need, uh, because that's what the Calverton process says. Well... I just again remind you, sir, paragraph 50 of Calverton, again, was, was, was the, the, the precursor to the other stuff in Calverton, and which said that housing, to, to argue that housing need alone con, con, constitutes a justification for a release of green, green belt, is a circular argument. In fact, you, there have to be lots of other things taken into account, which is why you have to go through a process of taking other factors into consideration. But the basic tenet is that the council does have a choice on how much development um, and that, that it considers to be acceptable. And I would, and I point you to um, this this debate going on in relation to a nearby local plan. That's a well in Hatfield local plan where I'm also involved in the examination there, where the, currently the inspector is considering whether or not well in Hatfield councils decision to propose a plan which doesn't meet all its needs, asking the council to justify that approach, where the council is basically saying, well, w we've looked at all the potential areas for Greenbelt release, we are releasing some of them, but beyond that we find we are unable to go beyond that because the other areas of Greenbelt that then would have to be lost are too important in one way or another, or the impact on the purposes of the green belt are so great that they shouldn't be released. And the, uh, the, count and the inspector there has asked them <coughs> to provide a, a statement or a further, further evidence on that issue before he considers the site-specific proposals in, in that plan. And to, mark, to our mind, that is a perfectly <coughs> legitimate approach to follow, which North Hearts have failed to carry out, and the consequences of which are they are proposing sites like this at Bulldog, which we think are totally out of scale with Bulldog and totally unacceptable in terms of their impact on the Greenbelt. And, um, and, so, and, and that is basically uh, what I wanted to say to you, sir, but I would just make one point, and that is if you were tempted to find this allocation sound, then surely you should only do so if that northern Greenbelt boundary is justified. And to my mind, from what we've heard, is the actual boundary line for the, the edge of the Greenbelt is not justified. That, that boundary should be drawn around the area that it limits the, the, the developed area of that site. It doesn't matter if the site itself goes beyond that Greenbelt boundary. I could see that could happen and that will give the, the developer and the council an opportunity to plant or create landscape buffer 
beyond the housing development itself, but but not but not in the green belt. That's a perfectly legitimate way of proceeding. And to that mind, sir, I would ask that if that is an approach that you find favour with, that you should ask the council to to draw a line on a map, not just leave it to the developer to come up with a line on a map. That ought to be determined through the plan, and it ought to be determined in respect of what is the impact in the landscape of development up to that boundary, bearing in mind what you see with your uh, uh, naked eye at the moment is um, the land as it is, not the land with buildings on. So uh, I'd ask you to take into account the um, develop drawing development back far enough that it, it doesn't break the skyline from key views. And that's all I have to say, sir. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Mr. Mr. James. Okay. Um, not a particularly structured response, but uh, hopefully um, an opportunity to pick up on some of the things that were raised by um, many of the people here today and how I think the local plan already begins to address them. Um, to start with, uh, the Green Belt um, issue and uh, the appropriateness of BA1. Um, it struck me arriving here today in what we've considered to be a bit of a model town. When you get to the train station at Letchworth, how the station finds itself in the middle of a settlement. And there's good reason why that happens in sustainability terms. Uh, when you think of a main line from London to Cambridge, the strategic importance of that infrastructure, I think it's incumbent upon us to consider the sustainability of, that, of any settlement along that line. Um, and how it finds itself surrounding the town, which is just one of the reasons to consider it. The other thing that I think makes it worthy of consideration is the fact that it sits, um, in a sense, in one half of a valley. So it rises up to a ridge line, which means that the development can happen on that northern side of the railway line and effectively be screened from the countryside beyond. I think the question that was raised was where that line is to be drawn. And I think it's right that the local plan leaves that as something that's uh, developed through design, because what it's going to require is a careful consideration of the visual impact, as well as the need to plant structural planting to help reinforce that screening. Um, and I think what the local plan also does is make sure that the land on the northern side of the development remains open by requiring that it is a country park. And I think that picks up that issue quite well. One of the, the things that falls out of uh, developing the site there is that suddenly Baldock has a railway line running through the middle of it. It won't be the first town to have that, uh, and wherever a railway line runs through a town, severance is an issue. And I think the local plan tries to address this in a number of ways quite well. The first is the railway station. Right now, the railway station uh, has got pretty poor access to the platform on the northern side. And it asks that as part of the development of BA1, the railway station access is upgraded so that there's a new bridge with an accessible lift or other means of getting over from one side to the other is included. And that crossing also serves to connect the BA1 site back to the center of the town. Uh, there's also the, the bridges, which the local plan require, uh, which cross over and link the north to the south as well as the need to include a pedestrian and cycle connection as part of the Northern Link Road Bridge, which crosses the railway line. Um, I think all of these serve to address the issue of severance, which uh, the railway line would otherwise present. I think there was a point earlier about the deliverability of this infrastructure. Um, I think we're in pretty advanced stages right now in our negotiations with Network Rail in terms of reaching a heads of terms agreement on the provision of this infrastructure. But I think for the purposes of the local plan, uh, the work that we've done has demonstrated both its technical deliverability, which I think is very important, as well as in the viability work that we've done and submitted as part of the application, demonstrated that it can be delivered as infrastructure as part of the scheme. Just so I'm clear, just does the council rely on any part of the evidence that's with the planning application but isn't in my examination library? Uh, no, sir, we answered that question okay. earlier on today. Yes, yeah, so I, I thought right. it was the case, but I thought that, I, uh, that there was some reference to it there from Mr. James. 
in terms of viability, I think. Well, um, I, th I think Mr. James is entitled to explain to you why he considers that the railway line is deliverable, bearing in mind that that's obviously something that you've got to consider. Um, and, and it's a question that you've, you've asked about as well. Uh, yes, but it's not, it's not something the council... I, I, I have to say, I've let Mr. James in accidentally. That's because I didn't realise um, he was here for the county council, and that's because I didn't have my glasses on. <laughs> um, um, I didn't intend, frankly, to, to let l promoting landowners in at this stage. So I just want to be clear about what the, what the council is relying on. Uh, otherwise, you know, you know what I'm going to get, people saying that, well, you, you're, you're talking about evidence that isn't in the examination library. That that's the potential issue. Yes, well, um, I mean, I think everybody here today has been giving you evidence that's not in the, in the examination library, sir. But um, it, it seems to me that it's relevant for you to hear from the promoter as to the deliverability of the um, access routes over the railway line, given that that is a point that has been specifically raised today by many objectors um, on, the, on the severance point, and it's a point it's that directly goes to SP14 it, in terms of the ability to cross that, it cross is, that yes. line. So giving you an up-to-date position in respect of negotiations with Network Rail um, seems to me to be information that, that is of, of value to yeah. you. Uh, that, that is, and I, I look forward to, to the letter from, from Network Rail as well that we, meant, that we mentioned earlier, which I asked for earlier. Well, I, 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 I'm, uh, yes, right, right, yeah. I, mean, I, I don't know what correspondence exists in, in relation to that, but um, I'm not privy to that information. But the point that you need to be satisfied about is whether or not there is either a realistic prospect that um, the um, route over the railway line can be delivered within the first five years or a reasonable prospect that it can be delivered over the planned period. Not that it, we don't need to demonstrate now that it can be delivered as we currently stand. That's not the test in the MPPF. So insofar as you're looking for a letter which categorically states that Network Rail have signed up to the delivery of the link, I, I'm not sure that such correspondence exists, but it wouldn't be necessary in order to satisfy the test in any event. Um, well, part of the, uh, remind me, um, is it coming forward in five years or part of this? It, it is, yes, so that would be the realistic prospect test. Um, yeah, okay. Um, nonetheless, I, I, you know, I have asked for, and I got agreement, I thought, um, for um, a letter to be provided from Network Rail, just setting out what, what their position is. Yes, so I'm, that yes I'm more than happy to, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Mr. James. Yeah, so, sorry if I'm jumping in at the wrong time. Um, I, I thought there was just one other point I should uh, take the opportunity to talk about, and that is uh, the traffic light intersection. Um, and I think that... In describing it as a bottleneck, it uh, really articulates the problem pretty well. As a medieval town, it's, uh, the, the current road layout is pretty constrained. There's only really one east-west way through the town, and that's through that traffic intersection, and only one north-south route as well. And as a result, that traffic junction is, is, is pretty squeezed. What the local plan tries to do with BA1 is not only to provide the route that would create the uh, transport structure that would support the scheme itself, but also tries to address the uh, constrained uh, road layout within the town. So by taking the town and creating two east-west links and two north-south links, uh, the link road that is included in BA1 actually begins to create a more open road network within Baldock. to leave it there for now. Thank you, Mr. James. Mr. Burroughs. Yes, sir. First of all, sir, would it help if, if Mr. James and I swapped round and then you'd have the county council all along here and the objectors all along there? Would, would that be convenient? That might be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> then you wouldn't need the spectacles either. <laughs> So, right, Mr. Bowes, I hadn't mistaken you for a representative of the county. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'd just like to uh, comment on a couple of points. So, uh, the first one is, I, I, I assume somewhere that, that the uh, 
the, uh, uh, the Save Rule of Baldock have actually presented, or somebody's presented, the, the County Council report uh, celebrating, uh, in 2000, celebrating the uh, presence of this uh, land, which was very important in the report, it stated that, um, very important uh, for, from the agricultural point of view. I don't know whether that's been put forward by anybody. No? Oh. All right, well, anyway, there is, sir. Uh, a, a number of times. It's certainly been part of our submissions, not That's discussed right. today, but it's been part of our documented evidence that we provided, yeah. I'd say the Smythe Road has yeah. cultural land. It has, yes, it, it is. So the county council themselves did say, um, one of the county councillors, who reviewed the county council's holdings, you know, stressing how important... Um, this land, the, the, for, from an agricultural point of view, the land is. Uh, and I, that hasn't really been mentioned strongly in that way, I feel. But it is important to, because I think it was submitted to uh, in the various uh, discussions uh, and, and hearings in front of North Hearts History Council. I think it has been referred to as a number of times. But it might be worthwhile, so you're, you're having a copy of that. I, I certainly have the point about the, um, the quality of the agricultural yes. land in, in representations. Yes, yes, yes thank you. Um, I'd like to turn, if I may, really just to the, the ecology side of things. Um, I, I was, I've looked up uh, Hart's ecology, and, to my, and, and I don't think the county council, as far as I can tell, has actually declared that Hearts Ecology is a department of the County Council. And so... They, they, when they did, um, if it helps, they did explain... Um, yesterday, I think it was. You were here, Mr. Burroughs. Well, I, I must have been out then, so sorry. Yes. But, but it's, it's a department of the County Council, uh, and it basically lends its services to district councils. Uh, and then I was astonished to hear that... The, discussion about the corn bunting because that was one of the um, examples we gave of a red listed species you'll recall um, and, the, uh, and one of the species that uh, in the last 30-40 years has reduced to about 10% of its actual um, uh, population it was 30, 40 years ago. Um, but there are other red species, uh, and it, it, I found it odd that the only uh, reference by Hertfordshire Ecology was the one we had uh, put forward. They didn't say anything at all about whether there are any other red species um, on uh, BA1, uh, which is very odd, bearing in mind that only just, well, several hundred yards from um, BA1, you've got LG1, um, where um, um, uh, Brian Sawford, who, as you know, was the <coughs> ecological expert for North Arts District Council until he retired some years ago, <laughs> and he said that there are uh, 16 red species. These are the ones that are seriously at risk. Not even mentioned by um, the, the North Hearts or the County Council. Uh, and um, also, the, the question of are we just sh shift to the corn bunting? I, I, I just find that astonishing. There's no suggestion, are there any problems with doing it? Um, you, you've been told that there are no ecological problems. Um, and I do think that it's, it is slapdash, to say the least. And I hope that no decisions are taken in respect to ecological problems until um, Hearts County Council or North Hearts District Council provide a, a proper report. In fact, I'd like to ask, if I may, uh, um, uh, uh, Brian Sawford, who gave some uh, uh, comments for us to do with LG1, I've asked them to come back in again 
because I do think it would be very helpful if anybody wanted to ask him questions or if he could make some statements about the ecology north there, because frankly what we've got is a statement from North Hearts District Council representative, oh, there's no problems. I, I found that astonishing. And, and I, I just, I, with respect, so I find it may, uh, surprising if you would just accept that in that way. I, I'm certainly um, getting the impression of your astonishment. So if you, if you, if you, <laughs> if you, move, I, if you move on from the various ways in which you can describe that. Could I, uh, could I, could I just else. ask Brian Sawford to take my place? And then he can give you his views and anybody... Um, well, um, anyway. is he going to be telling me things that um, have fair root in your representation? Or, or is this new? Th this, is, this is to do with the... Um, no, 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 please answer my question, sorry. Mr. Burroughs. What's the question? Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, is the idea that Mr. Sawford comes and, and tells me something new that has um, no relation to what you've said in your representation? Um, not really, no, so I don't, I don't think so. Uh, are these now, before, before I hear it, is yeah. this, like, let me be, clear question, yes or no answer, is this the kind of thing that you have said in your representation? You mean the representation now? Uh, no, not now. In your written, sorry, in your Regulation 19 written representation. Um, because if you haven't, then I'm, I'm going to have to say no. I'm, I'm not sure without referring to it. So there is so much paperwork. And so on, well, well, I'm talking about things that you've written. Sorry. I, I'm, talk I'm talking about th things that, that you have written. What I, what I can't allow you to do yes. um, is go unfairly beyond the boundaries of what you have written in your Regulation 19 statement objecting oh. to the plan, if you remember. If you can't remember, then um, no, it I strikes me as unlikely that you said it. Uh, in fact, yes, but the problem is there hasn't... Uh, I'm responding to something that suddenly come up from the District Council, making assertions that are clearly uh, totally un un unfounded. Well, the, thing, the council has always, um, since submitting the plan, um, relied on the evidence of North Hearts Ecology. Um, and if you had a problem with that, um, then it was open to you to have said so in your Regulation 19 statement. What I can't do, um, for, for example, um, it, well, I can't allow you to start introducing <coughs> points that are new from you. Yes. If, you, if you see what I mean. I, I simply can't do that. I've, I've stopped people doing that, and, I, and I'm holding the line on that. But, but if, Hearts, if, if uh, North Hearts District Council has introduced uh, the Hertfordshire or Hearts Ecology, uh, which I guess, since we started ourselves making representations, uh, then what you're saying is that, that that's it and we can't respond to it. Um, well, no, what I'm saying is um, if you'd had a pr an issue to take with the evidence that was there at the time of the Regulation 19 consultation, um, then it was open to you then to have taken it up in, in your representations at Regulation 19 stage. You, you can't simply, how should I put it, you can't just bowl up um, to the hearing sessions and start saying things that you haven't mentioned in your representation, written representations well, before. Yes, we mentioned the uh, corn buntings as being on a line, including uh, this uh, side, uh, north, south, if you remember, southwest and northeast, covering the line off the Chilterns. So we did mention the corn bunting, which mm -hmm. makes me feel that the only reason it's mentioned by uh, Hearts Ecology is, is they were asked to produce some sort of refutation of that. And we did mention, if you remember, sir, that the, the, it was the line of the children's and the corn bunting going uh, uh, southwest and northeast along that line. Oh, along the corridor you're talking about. Yes, and, and also it was mentioned that there was a single... Um, Corn bunting um, uh, uh, review, not review is the wrong word, um, um, study, uh, which was, I think, on that uh, line. Uh, and, and 
really, I, I don't see, to be honest, sir, but uh, the, I just feel that what's happened is they haven't bothered to look at other rare species there. They've simply taken the one uh, which we raised, and they said, oh, well, let's, let's answer Anthony Burroughs' complaint, and, uh, and uh, we'll leave it at that. But they haven't said what other rare species are there. This is the point I'm making, sir. Yeah, I have the point. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Was that, are you off now, Mr. Burris? Uh, yes, I am, yes, okay. sir. I've got to come back <laughs> this right. afternoon okay. for Hitchin, Fine. if it takes place. <laughs> right. okay. uh, thank you, sir, for letting me make the point. Yes, thank you very much. Mr. Ball. Um, could I just start with two fairly small points of amendment? Um, one regards our statement, um, um, page 4, paragraph 2.5. Just the one from David Russell Associates. Yeah. You want to make an amendment to it? Oh, well, I just want to want to acknowledge um, paragraph 2.5 says yeah. that no planning applications were submitted at the time of writing. I'm yeah. just simply acknowledging the fact that they have been. Yeah, fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, the second point is, um, relates to North Hart's statement on this matter, um, paragraph 56 on page 10. Um, of the council statement? The council statement, yeah. Okay, I have that. Right, this refers to um, the one discarded site around Bulldog being Western Way. Um, I would also suggest that the land that belongs to my clients, Green King PLC, um, referenced BA12, um, was also a discarded site. So effectively there should be at least two discarded sites referred to in their statement. I don't know whether they agree with that, but that's that's my feeling. Um, well, I mean that, that ought to be a matter of fact, shouldn't it? I think is that is that correct? Um, if I address that point directly now, when we talk about reasonable alternatives in our statements, um, only sites that sort of made it through the, the strategic housing and land availability assessment were counted as reasonable alternatives, and I think we've went through this when we were talking about the site selection process um, at the tail end of last year. The site being referred to effectively failed in the council's view, the Schlar test, the strategic housing land availability, and that we didn't consider it a suitable location for development. So in that sense, it was filtered out at that stage. It didn't go forward, and there were there is a longer list of sites that didn't make it through the Schlar, but as, as we've said to you before, I think when we're discussing the site selection process, for the purposes of moving the plan forward, those weren't reasonable alternatives, so I think that's just where the distinction is between the two. Yeah, but okay. we can come back on that point, because I think it picks up on points that others have made when we respond in due course. I understand. Um, yeah. In which case, um, I, will you permit me to talk about that site in terms of... Um, uh, your, your question. Um, depends what your point is um, exactly. Um, is your point that um, your, the site that you're referring to um, is a reasonable alternative that the council ought to have considered? Um, yes, that is, that is our viewpoint. Um, and if I can just elaborate on that a little. Very, I will I, do it very I, I will briefly. Allow it, but only extremely briefly. Okay. Three reasons. I mean, you, you know, I'm just going to explain to ev to everyone why uh, the, the reason for this is I'm, I'm not um, really discussing um, 
what I refer to as omission sites, that is sites that um, aren't in this plan, um, and that is because uh, my, my job is to examine this plan, um, which means the things that are in it. Um, and if, for, if I did feel um, that for whatever reason, um, either because I wasn't happy with a site that's in the plan and so said it had to come out and therefore the council thought that it needed to find an al alternative sites, that would be for the council um, to do. I, I, I'm not um, generally speaking in the business of telling local authorities what sites um, they should allocate um, in those sorts of situations. It would be for the council to consider. Um, is there anything, I, mean, I have to say I'm extremely reluctant um, is it not helpful to you, though, to know that these other sites do exist? It's not. Pardon? Is, isn't it not useful to you to know that these other sites exist if you are thinking of excluding a site? Uh, well, what, what I, I need. So they could meet their need. Yeah, well, what, what, what I need to do um, is understand um, what the council has done in relation to um, reasonable alternatives. Um, what I don't need to do at this stage um, is to have a beauty contest of other sites that didn't make it um, into the plan. And the problem is, you see, that if I let Mr. Ball tell me about his site, um, everyone else um, who has a site in the district that didn't make it into the plan um, will want to come along and tell me about it. Um, which, which is why I, I have to say, I'm, I, I have your statement um, and I know you expressed some frustration in, in your statement <laughs> yes, um, indeed. Ab ab about, about the approach, but just to explain, that is why I'm taking the approach um, that, I'm, that I'm taking. Do you, do you follow? Does that all kind of, does that make sense? I know it doesn't necessarily make you a happy man, but, but, <laughs> but um, do, do, you understand the, do you understand the logic? Yeah, yes, I do understand the logic. Um, it's just, it seemed to me that in relation to some of the points that were being made about the way the green belt boundary was being defined, I had a couple of points to make that would illustrate um, you know, uh, yeah. and issues of coalescence with neighbouring settlements. I think the, the thing here is, Mr. Ball, I mean, I, I, you know, I've, I've been in these hearings for quite a long time yes. um, now, and, and I've heard um, all sorts of things, lots of things, that I have to think very carefully um, about. And on some matters, I may well agree with the council, on some matters, I may agree with others. Um, so I, I need to think those things through um, and reach my conclusions, um, I think, before um, I start to consider um, what else I need to consider. Um, so whether is there, if there is a need for me to um, give consideration to, um, say, striking some sites out of the plan um, and asking the council to look for um, alternatives instead, that, that is the stage of this examination, if, if I get there, that is the stage of this examination um, where um, the owners of other land um, would again potentially become involved in any further site selection work that the council um, needed to undertake. Right, I take that as a no, then. <laughs> um, yes, the, the short answer is no. <laughs> yeah. um, I just felt that I at least needed to mention it because I am here after all, <laughs> because um, I'm representing Green King who own the land. I'm, anyway. I'm, I've have, I have read yeah. your statement, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. well aware of, I'm well aware yeah, of, of, of that. Fine. Right. Um, I would like to sort of turn now to the more general issue of um, um, allocation BA1 and its relationship to the definition of the green belt. Um, you asked the question as to whether um, the, the, if you like, whether there are exceptional reasons for releasing this land from the green belt. And I think the council's view on this is that the exceptional reason is the objective assessment of housing need. And those arguments I think have been rehearsed in other, in, in other places. Um, 
I think. It seems to it seems to me that assuming that the search for land to meet housing needs starts with areas excluded from the green belt, then green belt land should only come into play once all those possibilities have been um, exhausted. And I think there is already a dilemma here because um, one of the Green Belt's purposes is to incentivize um, regeneration um, and redevelopment within existing settlements. Um, and I will say that um, I've been involved in um, representations to Mole Valley District Council where they face that particular point head on by making it quite clear that one option is that you do, you do not review the green belt, meet your housing needs within existing settlements, but one of the implications of that is, of course, it doesn't only mean increasing densities for town centres, but also increasing densities for suburban areas and so on. So it's actually putting that particular option right in front um, of, of the people that they're consulting. Now... The plan before us says that in order to meet the um, objectively assessed housing needs, um, the size of Baldock must be effectively or effectively doubled over the next 15 to 20 years. The LPA's own evidence in its own statement um, shows that this will have significant consequences for the local landscape, will lead to the loss of best quality agricultural land, and the purpose of the Green Belt will be compromised in terms of protecting open countryside from urban encroachment. So the question really amounts to do housing needs trump all those considerations? Now, the MPPS paragraph 83 says it's appropriate to review greenbelt boundaries through the local plan process. But should such a review extend to effectively doubling the size of a settlement within an existing greenbelt? So that will set precedents for making significant changes elsewhere to other settlements, which surely will undermine an existing Greenbelt's long-term permanence. I put a wider question here, which is, maybe there will come a time when the Greenbelt can no longer be sustained against the demand for housing. And perhaps the current round of um, objectively assessed housing these documents represents, if you like, a first knock on the door. However, I think it would be wrong to interpret paragraph 83 as justifying the use of the local plan process to make substantial changes to existing Greenbelt settlements. If it did, then the Greenbelt could easily become subject to death by a thousand cuts and undermine public confidence in their long-term permanency. If we really have reached the point where housing leaders calling into question how existing green belts should be considered, that surely must be debated at a national rather than a local level. I agree that the local plan process is rightly used to make changes to greenbelt boundaries, but not on the scale proposed here. Any changes around settlement should be kept to a minimum related to the scale of the settlement itself. One of the policy's original intentions was to keep open land and countryside close to the heart of settlements within the greenbelt. If those settlements' other needs could not be met without compromising the extent of the greenbelt, then they should be met by existing or new settlements beyond the Green Belt. I find the LPA's, um, the council, sorry, justification for allowing the housing need requirement 
to trump other considerations, I think is ultimately a bit coy. It's almost as if they feel that what is being proposed is a bit naughty, and they then go on to say they won't do it again. In the long term, they say they will <coughs> look at new settlement proposals and engage the duty to cooperate to meet long-term needs in areas beyond the Green Belt. However, this simply begs the question as to why the LPA didn't look at these options this time around. I would agree with um, some of the sentiments that have been expressed that the current proposals for altering the Green Belt around Bulldog begin to look more like a matter of expediency as being perhaps one of the easier places to pull back the Green Belt to make way for housing needs. I just want to make a point on the question of um, the effect, or at least the purpose of the Green Belt in preserving the special character and setting of an historic town. Because I interpret that as meaning there's the setting, meaning the land which surrounds that particular settlement. Bulldog as has been quoted by a number of people, sits in a hollow, it's surrounded by a series of low chalk hills. I would say that those low chalk hills are a fundamental part of the setting of the historic town of Bulldog. Now, the council statement refers in tables A and B on page 13 of their statement to the limited effect of allocations BA1 to BA4 on the town's historic character. Um, I do disagree with that assessment, as I think all those allocations will have a significant effect on Bulldog setting. Although the hills to the east of the town do not run as close, even though I would suggest that even the existing Clough Hall Common estate starts to break Bulldog's appearance as an ancient settlement nestled in a hollow and surrounded by chalk hills. The proposed changes to the town's eastern boundary to accommodate allocations BA 2 to 4 will extend the existing urban sprawl eastwards up to the A505. However, I am convinced that BA1 will have a much greater effect on Bulldog setting since it is located on the hills to the north, which form part of the town's surrounding backdrop. And once developed, it will look, in my eyes, like a sort of urban tsunami threatening to engulf the historic town below. Now, I do note from the master plan that has been produced as part of the planning applications, that in a sense they've put a green top on that wave um, and called it a country park. Um, what that suggests to me is that, in a sense, the, the boundary that's being proposed there is effectively contrived. In other words, it doesn't exist, and it needs to be reinforced by something else. It would seem to me that if 2,800 houses can be, can be accommodated without the use of that large area of land, then the allocation boundary should have been drawn differently so, so that it doesn't include the land that goes up to the ridge line. Um, I understand the problems now in trying to define that boundary, but it seems to me a more logical boundary would have been around the edge of the urban development and that the proposed country park area should, should, be, um, should remain um, as part of the Green Belt designation. I think that basically are the points that I would like, like to make. Um, I think there are very serious issues here in terms of you know, making a planning balance between housing needs and between, um, and between green belt and environmental requirements. And this, in fact, is obviously, as I'm sure you know from your own experience, an issue that's being faced by local authorities in many places. But I think 
uh, such, a, such a major change to a green belt around an existing green belt settlement should not really be the subject of this particular process. If we're talking about such large changes, then we need some form of guidance from a national level before those can become you know, part and parcel, if you like, of what can be considered as part of the local planning process. As I say, otherwise, what we're going to get is the, as I said, the death of the green belt by a thousand cuts. Thank you very much, sir, for listening. Thank you, Mr. Ball. Um, is that everything from, um, if, I, if I can put it this way, from, from people this side of the, the table, um, that those objecting um, to site BA1? Mr. Baker. One simple statement, sir, and that's in relation to Greenbelt and exceptional circumstances. And just a reminder, I, I should have said it. I said it yesterday. There's a lot of emphasis in the council statement that this site, in this case, this site is a major opportunity. And major opportunity is not in itself an, an exceptional circumstance that justifies the release of the, a, a site like this from the Greenbelt. Thank you, sir. Anything else from um, the objection side of the table before I have the final word from the council? Um, at which point we might have got all the way through the first sight of the day. No? Okay, very good. Um, is that you, Ms. Symes? Ah, um, Ms. Ms. Clinch. Thank you. Um, over to my colleague, um, Mr. James, touched on um, deliverability of the site as well as as points on urban design and literally deliverability for infrastructure. Um, I'd like to pick up a couple more points to do with the deliverability and then on the environment, the points that have been raised, and then ask my colleague Colin Shields just here to pick up on some of the highways points. That's okay? Yeah. I'll be as concise as possible. Um, so in terms of deliverability, it's important to mention that Hertfordshire County Council property is committed to bring forward these allocations and um, are developing a department at the moment, a Hearts Living Property Company, as a potential way of bringing forward some of these allocations around Baldock. And that uh, we submit these two applications, one for BA1 and one for the one sites we'll talk about later, um, which demonstrate the council's commitment to these sites and the work we've undertaken um, that underpins those, or if not for today, but just raise the commitment in, in that respect. Um, the second point is in relation to the um, memorandum of understanding with Network Rail. Um, I should have mentioned earlier that we've uh, we've got a draft circulating with them at the moment, and we can provide you with that. And uh, hopefully, when our colleague from Network Rail is back from holiday next week, we should be able to get that signed to you. But that includes um, a schedule of all the works, especially the train stations, um, the new access uh, over the railway line, and their commitment to working with us on that and to working with public sector authorities such as Hertfordshire County Council on that point. And they're very, um, they're very willing to work with us to close the level crossing that currently goes across the railway line, which they see was a safety issue, um, and rerouting the public right of way that goes across there um, to the vehicular access. So they're on board, <laughs> literally, on that one. Um, and then uh, the third point to mention as deliverability is that um, we're keen to secure all of the infrastructure for the sites via Section 1 and 6 agreement, which will be agreed and has been discussed to date with the relevant providers and the a viability assessment, which is ongoing. Um, we we submitted with the application shortly when that's finalised. Um, will set out the costs for all of the infrastructure and how the phasing of the development works. But uh, as submitted at the moment and the auditor scheme that you have in front of you, that all stacks up and we're happy with that. Okay. Um, just to pick on a couple of points about the environment, um, the corn buntings have been mentioned quite a lot this morning. The solution we propose in our planning applications for that, which the local plan makes provision for in terms of finding an appropriate solution. I can confirm that we have found an appropriate solution and that's doable in terms of the local plan and that um, the reason for that is that the, the land to be secured is owned by Hertfordshire County Council and joins the site. 
So it's a deliverable solution and mitigation is set out within our statement, um, including the maintenance of hedge hedgerows and certain types of farmland. That's what I think will be secured on that site. So that's deliverable. Um, and then there's the other wildlife on the site. We've looked into um, an extensive <laughs> number of different studies and uh, that, that's also our planning application as well as council evidence based on what they've done and um, we've made conclusions that we have solutions for those and those don't preclude the allocation of a site in the local plan and there's solutions for mitigation for those constraints. And then um, in terms of drainage as well, it's in situation. Um, we've already talked about the fact that the site's in flood zone one doesn't present a flood risk, but there's um, drainage constraints within the site, but um, a drainage strategy can be developed that overcomes that, so that doesn't preclude allocation of the site either. And, uh, it's worth noting that the mitigation for those and a range of other constraints that you normally get on sites like this um, are all set out within um, the Section 106 heads of terms and... Um, viability assessments, so we don't have any concerns there. And now I'll just ask my colleague uh, Colin Shields to just talk about the highways points that have been raised. Thank you. Mr Shields? Uh, yes, I, um, I'm not going to introduce any new evidence. Um, we've prepared a detailed transport assessment to go in with a plan application, and that detailed assessment agrees with the work that's been done in support of the local plan um, um, transport work and demonstrates delivery of the measures that have been identified by the district councils supporting transport work. So in terms of um, the Bulldog bottleneck and, and the link road, the, the two are intertwined. And the key point to understand is that link road, well, pe people, uh, they're right in, 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 in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the queuing that occurs at the Bulldog bottleneck. Um, there may be some disagreement on the exact length of queues, but it is over capacity. What the link road will provide is a redistribution of traffic. So my colleague, Mr James, described this a little bit earlier. In terms of that will take existing and future flows out of the junction, which then means um, our improvement that we've identified in the transport assessment, which fully complies the district council's transport work is is a small scale improvement in terms of signal optimization it's not what dr ween um, said is to the detriment of pedestrians it doesn't reduce the, the crossing time for pedestrians it's a signal optimization so by taking traffic out of that bottleneck and then improving the junction within the constraints that everybody's described to you we're able to demonstrate delivery of an improvement scheme at that junction. There were a couple of questions that you asked was, who would pay for it? The development would pay for it. You, and I think you also asked, when would that improvement take place? Our work has identified that that improvement needs to take place at a very early phase of the, of the delivery of the site. Um, so that would be one of the first improvement measures that we would carry out. Um, so, from a transport perspective, the, the mitigation measures are deliverable, uh, the phasing has been identified, and we've identified that the development would be funding these works, and these are the same works as identified in the Council's transport strategy underpinning the local plan. Thank you, Mr Shields. Anything else from the um, Council before I um, break for lunch? Just, just, just maybe just round up just, just a couple of points. Um, can I just take them in turn? Um, firstly, it's been suggested that um, there's an OBRA provision um, of the um, housing in uh, North Hearts. I'm going to ask Mr. Smith, um, is North Hearts essentially over providing um, a, 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 as against the need that's been identified um, for this HMA and in particular North Hertfordshire? No, we're not. The um, plan provides for the objectively assessed needs 
um, for North Hertfordshire um, and, to, sorry, clap one answer, not for Stevenage, um, as was suggested by um, one of the points here. Um, we're providing to objectively assess needs for North Hertfordshire and also making a contribution to unmet needs from Luton, at the east of the district, and that's the allocation we're due to discuss tomorrow. The second point is, insofar as transport is concerned, whether or not there's an acceptable transport solution um, in respect to the delivery of um, Site BA1. I'm going to first of all ask Mr Flowerday, is the Highway Authority um, satisfied that there is a transport solution which will enable Site BA1 to come forward in an acceptable manner insofar as the operation of the highway network is concerned? We are. Um, there's uh, some wider issues that I think um, are being addressed in the network which will help to ease the situation. Um, as we've heard today, the majority of the traffic that travels down through that junction, um, that the Baldock traffic signals as you've referred to it, sir, um, is in the peak periods is largely um, traffic that emanates from outside of Baldock. Uh, it doesn't cause its own problem, it's, it's through traffic that's causing the problem. So part of the solution is actually um, improvements being promoted by Highways England on the A1M at junction 6 to 8, the smart motorway works, which are due to commence on site in April 2020. Um, and our modelling work has shown on our county-wide model that that has quite a significant impact in traffic rerouting back to the A1M um, rather than using um, viable rat runs or alternative routes to avoid using the A1M. So a, a, a proportion of the traffic will be taken out of Bulldog as a consequence of that improvement. Um, and then the link road coupled with the um, solution proposed for um, the Bulldog traffic signals um, would leave a solution that isn't considered to be severe in our view. Flood risk, I'm going to ask Ms. Symes to deal with this. Firstly, um, is the site um, in an area of flood risk? Yes or no? No, it's, it's in flood zone one, so it's not an, an area of flood risk. Insofar as there are any surface water issues, um, can those be um, adequately addressed um, in respect of the bringing forward of BA1? I believe they can be, and that's... Um, specified as a specific criteria within policy SP14. Coming on now to landscape impact, I'm going to ask Ms. Ahern to deal with this. Um, and I'd like Ms. Ahern just to, just to focus on this question. Um, in carrying out a landscape assessment of the effect of bringing forward this site for development, um, is um, she satisfied that in so far as drawing development um, below the ridge line, um, that that will um, lead, um, will, will that ensure that there won't be any unacceptable impacts in terms of um, visual amenity um, from the development of the site? <coughs> okay, thank you. Uh, this, ref this refers to. Um, <laughs> My, my apologies, I, I can't see your name there. It's Ahern. Thank you. This um, <coughs> refers to the document uh, CG4, which is the Landscape Sensitivity Study, um, where we looked specifically at this site, but on an area which was larger than the allocation site, and we divided it into two areas, B2, which was south of the Bygrove Road, and B1, which was north of the Bygrove Road, and ran up further to the north across the valley where the boundary of the allocation site is and further to the north. We went through a standard landscape sensitivity assessment and we identified the area to the north B1 as of uh, moderate to high landscape and visual sensitivity and the area to the south, um, B2, south of the Bay by Grove Road, as moderately low. Uh, the proposed allocation <coughs> site covers all of our area B2 and approximately half of our area B1. 
Uh, within our documents, we identified areas of higher sensitivity, um, which included that ridge line. The area, um, as we set out, is of moderate to high sensitivity in landscape terms. It remains of moderate to high sensitivity. Um, there are ways that you can mitigate impacts, but with any development, uh, there will be, of this size, there will be landscape impacts. The, um, I haven't looked at the master plan for the proposal, uh, but it does take account of our recommendations to uh, the further the development could be, be moved south, away from the open rolling ridges is preferable. And can I just have your help? Um, the, the policy SP14 um, talks about structural planting to create a sense of place and integration into surrounding landscape and to reinforce a long-term defensible greenbelt boundary. Um, can you just help the inspector in so far as the creation of a county park and the woodland planting that would come with that? Um, uh, as matters currently stand in principle, is that policy requirement capable of being satisfied in, in your view? Could you just, um, is the proposal, could you just repeat that question yeah, for me? Policy SP14, yes. criteria C, is that criteria capable of being satisfied in your view? Yes, that can be satisfied. Uh, that it, is, it doesn't take away that, the, that this is an area of moderate to high sensitivity, um, but that can, um, planting uh, along the northern boundary is, uh, is a positive proposal. Okay, thank you. And uh, moving on to ecological constraints, and we're going to ask Ms. Symes to, um, to deal with this. Um, in so far as the ecological constraints that have been identified by um, Hertfordshire Ecology is concerned, in, in particular in relation to corn bunting, does the um, policy SP15, and in particular subcriteria J, um, in, in terms of the, and, and also looking at paragraph 4.185 of the um, explanatory text, which um, makes provision for compensation um, requirements. As a matter of principle, does that adequately address, or is that designed to address, um, the ecological constraint that has been identified um, by, by the Hertfordshire Ecology um, responses? Yes, it has been. And, and therefore, is there any concern that corn bunting won't be adequately addressed if BA1 comes forward and policy SP14 is complied with? Well, as long as there is a suitable offsetting of land as, as proposed, as suggested, and from the guidance that we were given from our consultants, um, that should satisfy the requirement. So I'm, I'm not going to ask the, the council to deal with green Greenbelt because it, it seems to me that, that that's a matter that we've already um, gone through in so far as the approach to Greenbelt and, and such like matters. It, it, that, that's obviously very, a very quick response to the points that have been raised, but is there anything um, that we need to help you with at this stage in relation to BA1? Uh, no, I mean, in terms of that, no, there isn't. Uh, and on, on the Greenbelt um, exceptional circumstances point, I mean, yes. clearly I know that Mr. Baker is going to say very similar things um, every time. Uh, so, just to, to rest yourself, Mr. Baker, you almost needn't bother because I know precisely what, what you're going to say and I know what the council's going to say as well because the same fundamental issues um, on, on, on those sites. Right. Sir, so I think that, that then, then we'll leave it there then. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Can I um, ask a question of understanding? Uh, yeah. Um, is it right that you can take on the unmet need from Luton but ignore 8,000 houses planned to go into areas two miles north of the boundary of North Hearts District Council, which would absorb part of our um, computed housing need? Is that, is that right and proper? 
Um, I, well, it depends what you mean by right and proper, but um, my, my job um, is, is to um, determine the, the soundness of um, this, this plan. Does that affect its soundness, is the question? Um, if well, you're, if you're planning to build houses that you've no need for. Well, uh, <laughs> um, if I thought that the council were um, providing houses that they didn't need to provide, um, then I would need to take a view on whether um, that was a sound approach or not. Are you, are you indicating, Mr. Bailey? I am, sir. Mm. Uh, just again, very simple. The county council, the county council, have advised that they are prepared to make suitable land available for corn bunting to offset the harm. Mm -hmm. um, I think so. You would need to see the evidence that that is land that isn't currently corn bunting suitable corn bunting habitat and in fact where corn buntings have not been found by the various surveys otherwise it isn't offsetting the loss of the land concerned. Thank you sir. Anything on any of that from the council? Okay thank you. We're going to take the lunch break now. Um, yeah, um, now after lunch I have scheduled to start at two o'clock hitching, um, which um, brings me to the inevitable, inevitable conclusion that we're not going to finish Baldock um, th this morning, um, so we need to find somewhere else to deal with it. And we have some reserved time, don't we? Uh, yes, we do. Um, does, does the council have um, any preference in terms of availability of people that you need? Well, so I, I, obviously I haven't had any opportunity to, to, to ask that question, but what I suggest I do is um, I will speak to the officers and um, through your programme officer we'll, we'll come up with some suggestions for um, recommencing that, that this session. C can I suggest that we... Um, that we don't start at two o'clock, though. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that we start either at quarter past or half past two. Um, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not planning to. to, um, to start. Even I am not that mean, Ms. Ormsby. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, yes, un unfortunately, um, in, in terms of um, the outstanding matters that we have for um, Baldock, um, I will have to schedule um, a session, and that will be in week commencing the 19th of March. You'll, you'll see on the, the, the online the, the timetable online that I have um, that set as a reserve um, week. Um, so I, I will find. Um, I'll ask the council to um, confirm the um, availability of their experts, um, and um, I will put a date on the online um, timetable. So um, do, do keep an eye out for that. If you're in any doubt, um, do speak to uh, Ms. St. John Howe. Okay. Um, resume at half past, Ms. Ormsby. Thank you, sir. Um, I make it 13.43. Um, I'll adjourn the hearing to resume in this room at uh, 2.30. Thank you.